probably behind in their reading. They can't do the independent work if their families don't sign with them. And so um, we just suggested that the interpreters get with the teachers to say, listen, you need to have a time where like in Google Class or Microsoft Teams or whatever, where the students can come in there and you can explain what needs to be done and give them the opportunity to ask questions. And so they would meet with, um, you know, a time during the with the students or whatever. But some of the interpreters shared that, um, like, for example, at this one student's house, um, they're, um, they are also migrant students. And um, they, um, they had, like, several kids, several children that they were trying mm -hmm. to let go on the Internet. And so it wasn't always convenient for that student to be able to come on board. So there were just so many different challenges. And, um, but some of the students, like if it was a lesson, let's just say, uh, some of the interpreters would go in and record the, a video of themselves interpreting that video. And they, what they would do is they would pull up the screen and it would show the video and the interpreter. They would make a recording of that and share that with the teacher so that the teacher would share it with the um, student. So, you know, and then some of the, self-contained classrooms, those teachers were able to do those lessons a little bit easier because they could just record themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So really the, the biggest concern that I heard was uh, the technology, the students not necessarily having access to Wi-Fi or being able to get online. And then um, some of the teachers, you know, providing more independent work that doesn't work well sometimes with deaf students. Um, one of the interpreters shared that there was a student at uh, Daniel Jeepin, and um, and she is the only deaf student there, and her family communicates with her by talking with her because she does read lips, uh, but she misses a lot. And so what happened is she would think that she had all of her assignments turned in, but the teachers were giving her low grades because she actually didn't. So there was a lot of, you know, sometimes the students would think that they understood, but they really didn't. So it's going to take a little bit more over collaboration, you know, or, or more collaboration, I guess. And, and um, getting the teachers to have these students to understand that they have to do more with the deaf students because they have to in be intentional about you know, making time for the students to come in and invite the interpreters in at that time as well. Okay. So a couple things. One, I forgot to start us recording at the beginning, so I I started a few minutes ago. <laughs> um, okay, about this. Yeah. Um, and so basically, all we've talked about so far is the is the um, related services piece and kind of how we're handling that. And then secondly, let's be careful when we're talking about cases or anything since it's being recorded and it'll be out. Um, oh, so we're not. Okay, just, I, I didn't. Hope I, did, I, I guess it, I did say the school. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. It's okay. I wouldn't have thought about it until after you said it. So um, mm -hmm. the um, so what I'm hearing you say then, Rhonda, is that for the deaf hard of hearing program. The, one of the biggest barriers is making sure that the students and their families have the technology access and the Wi-Fi availability, which mm -hmm. I think is probably an issue across the board for lots of kids beyond just our deaf, hard of hearing students. And then right. secondly, is our access and working with the teachers ahead of time to give them a heads up on this is what we're going to need to do above and beyond a little bit for these students to keep them engaged and things like that. Um, yes, and to make sure that, it, you know, if there is a, a lesson um, that um, the interpreter would have access to that lesson, to be able to, like, if it's a live lesson, you know, then the interpreter can either be there live and it can be recorded to be shared, or, you know, maybe the teacher would teach it and give the students the opportunity to view it later, and so the would need access to that video so he could make he or she could make a recording of that and to share okay you know so it does take a lot of you know 
working together to make sure that this particular group of students have access. Right. So this okay. is what I'm hearing. Um, and, and I brought it up in a prior meeting, um, but our, our interpreters are doing a hundred times the work than other, you know, paras or teachers, because if the teacher gives, and, and I'm not sure if the teacher really understands the magnitude of what's happening, but if a teacher gives a lesson and the kids have to go on to a website, that interpreter has to interpret every single link, every single video. Um, if there's an external link, the videos that are on that, by law, that's what mm -hmm. they have to do. And I don't mm -hmm. think the teacher realizes how much work uh, has to go into, um, because it's their rights, you know, the mm -hmm. student's rights. Um, so maybe, you know, teaming up with the teacher to look at the lesson plans and see, and, you know, I don't know if the, the interpreter can say like, that's going to be a lot of work, you know, <laughs> that's going to be a, a full eight hour day interpreting this, you know, one link to, <laughs> you know, what, whatever the lesson may be. Um, so, what, so Sarah, Sarah, oh. do you mean, so if, um, if a teacher was doing a doing a lesson and they wanted the the student to go to I don't know um, I don't know Education Week you know newspaper or whatever yeah the student goes to that website and then the interpreter is having to interpret what's on that website or in that article or something because that would be yes they yeah, would have to that. interpret. Everything that was in the article, and then if there were links on that page, like, you know, click here for more information or, you know, whatever, I was told that they have to, because that link is there and available for them, they would have to now interpret whatever that was as no. well. Yeah, no, that, no. that's not okay. entirely yeah. true, because what happens is the interpreter is communication link between two people, so like the deaf student and the teacher. So anything that is taught or verbally said, yes. And, and then also part of the accommodations are that students are, I should say services, are that students can have, like, for example, if they're in a math classroom or a math class and they're uh, going to be taking a test, if the student needs that um, those test answers or questions read, and the choices or whatever, they can have that. But when something is independent work that this that all students are independently working on, that's really where the gap is. Interpreters do not, they're not responsible for making sure that everything on every link in every book, can you imagine if they had gave them a textbook to read over the summer? That is yeah, not no. the interpreter's responsibility to read that whole textbook. You know, the, okay. the accommodations no. are more specific than that. And yeah. um, and so to open up a link and expect the interpreter to teach that is really what then it crosses over to the interpreter becoming the teacher. And that is not the interpreter's responsibility, but it is right. a gap. And it, it really is well, a challenge. Well, the other piece to that is if a if a teacher assigns some type of a assignment through a website link that they have to go, like the example I give of going and reading this article and and mm -hmm. providing a summary of it or something, that's a very you know basic kind of a thing. The student themselves has to go and read that and then and provide the responses and all like that. And a student that's deaf hard of hearing can go and see it and read it. Now, if but we're talking the, about a, vis a visually impaired student, we'd be having a whole different conversation. But right. so that, an interpreter would not be responsible for going and interpreting and reading on off of a website what is intended for the student to go and explore and, and do. But that is, the activity. Really, that is really the issue at hand is because <clears throat> about 90% of the students, I keep using 90%, but at, nevertheless, the reading is really the issue for many of these deaf students. They, they, their reading level falls way behind. 
And unless a parent can help them read it, which if they don't sign with them, you know, they they can't read it. That student gets left out, you know, and, and, and what happens is a lot of the interpreters do see it as their responsibility and they will go above and beyond and they actually, um, Sarah, what happens is the interpreter is the one that sees it, cares about it, and sees that the student is drowning. And so they do cross that line of going over and becoming them the teacher. They're just going in and reading everything for them. But we're, you know, interpreter, the role is really not as a reader. We can read things for a test or whatever. But we can't just read everything. A student, like Dr. Mikey said, has to be responsible for that. But if they can't read, then that is another issue that needs to be addressed. And because they're not getting the same, um, they're not actually getting this education during this time if they're being taught virtually. Right. Well, and the, and the, the poor, the reading deficits, Dr. Sankey, we lost you. Sarah, do you hear Dr. I'm going to sign out and come back in because I don't hear anything. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you oh. hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Rhonda, can you hear me? I can. Sorry about that. I don't know if you all can hear each other or not. Hello. Yep, there you are. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I can see Rhonda. <laughs> okay. okay. All righty. I think let's we're back. It. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> um, so anyways, so it sounds like we definitely have some communication kinds of things that we need to outline between the deaf hearty hearing team and the teachers as far as accessibility for the kids and kind of what the role is of the interpreter in that whole process. Yes, um, definitely. Okay. So that can be something that we that we list for the services interpreters and all that. Um, the other thing I know that came up for the DHH um, staff was the equipment as far as the, the masks and um, face shields and things like that and how that was going to work. I'm yeah. that um, that on the other group that's doing kind of the all that those kinds of things that they're going to be covering that. Mm -hmm. um, 
Gina had also sent me several questions and things and some emails that I'll, I'll share with um, Tedra and the team over there that's working on that. I know that we are ordering things district wide for staff PPE. Mm -hmm. um, so wonderful. I, you know, for the kids that come back face to face and the staff that's back face to face, I don't really know how we're going to cross that barrier of needing to have a mask versus needing to see the teachers you know, mouth and as far as they're speaking and instruction. And then of course the interpreters doing that too. Um, right. And that's why Gina had put in hers and I had mentioned it in mine as well, that we need those clear shields. Right. That, so we can still see the uh, facial expressions and the mouth morphing. Right. But um, I, about that, the lead interpreter meeting, I never even thought about this. I thought they were relatively safe. But they really don't protect your, um, you know, your nose and your mouth because right. they're open at the bottom. But um, I was talking to Gina about that. And Gina said, well, what I plan to do is to have my mask ready. Then when I'm not interpreting, I'll just put the mask back on underneath right. the shield. You know, so anyway. And there, uh, the lead interpreter meeting, they also shared some, some of the link of, uh, some of the masks that were being used. I don't know if you all get ready to order those if you want to see any of those. Uh, but I know, like you said, I, I can share that with Gina. They're working on that. Okay. Well, Audrey and the team there have already done a big order and or they're working oh. on a big order. Um, okay. I don't recall the number of shields and things that they were doing, but I know as far as masks, of course, they mm -hmm. have to get certain ones because they have to be a certain level of protection. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. Um, you so know, have we heard anything about mandating the kids to wear masks? Or, I mean, I've strategy? not heard anything on that specifically. Um, I think that'll be part of the what comes out of this task force. Kind of, rec you know, yeah. what the task force is doing is ultimately providing what recommendations we have. Right. So right. our, you know, our little three group right here would basically be saying at least for the DHH staff. Or anybody like that we would have to recommend face shields because of the fact that people need to see kids need to see the teachers faces and interpreters faces or mouth and be able to do that um i want to move on if we can to the iep meetings and updates just to kind of give a quick update on that we've actually been kind of working on this for several months um you know we had the process in place already for iep meetings through um Oh my gosh, I forget the name of the program. Uh, you, go to um, connect, I think it was. Go, yeah, something like that. And from what I know, when I actually participated in several IEP meetings and and um, during you know towards the end of the year using it, um, it worked well. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, it it met all the security things we needed. Parents were able to participate either via the computer or via phone, which Parents have always been able to participate in a meeting via phone. So that part was really nothing new. Um, and we were able to get signatures and, and document how we were going to do that. So we'll continue those practices. Okay. What we've also done is um, Sherry Scott um, has already put a, they've already got a plan in place and have started in June to do um, student evaluations face to face um, with psychologists and things as they needed to do them. They've, got a million different security measures in place for all that and are scheduling them at, at very specific sites around the district. Um, so we'll keep that going and can get caught up on student evaluations. Of course, the priority ones are the ones that were under the six, you know, originally 60 day timeline for initial evaluations. Um, and then though you know any others and reevaluations and things like that so we i feel like we have a plan in place for that um i've also though spoken with diane taylor and anastasia about how our schools are going to be able to pick up with iep meetings immediately as soon as staff returns whether virtually or face to face and how we'll kind of prioritize those um, as a district you know we're going to be looking at all kids and how they've performed throughout the, throughout the shutdown and then throughout the summer and kind of see what we need to do district-wide for all kids as far as 
any kind of remediation or whatever. And that, of course, would be part of the instructional continuity plan coming back. Um, but what we've also talked about is then when you look at your students with disabilities, you kind of have to, you know, a, an administrator, the way I kind of picture it is the administrator would have, I don't know, say they have 100 students with disabilities on their campus. They're going to be able to look at that group of 100 students globally and say, OK, I've got these 20 that I know participated full time. They are, you know, the teachers did not encounter any kind of issues with them. They didn't have any access issues. They completed their assignment. You know, they they seem to have gotten the system and did well. And, um, you know, we know that they can kind of jump back in and get going and, and they'll be OK. Then they're going to have their another group in the middle that kind of might have been a little okay one day they were in one day they were out maybe they participated maybe they didn't maybe they did the minimum just to kind of get through the rest of the year maybe they had access issues you know didn't have a device maybe there was five kids at home and they were you know kind of what it is they're kind of in that middle group of okay we need to kind of check in on them let's see how we're going to start with them and then they're going to have a group of kids that are will have been able to have done nothing, made no progress for a variety of reasons. Either they just chose to not participate, they didn't have a device, they were ill, they had family things going on, you know, maybe they had to leave the district, leave the county for a while, you know, I, it could be a million different things. Um, and so those are going to kind of be the ones that they're going to have to focus on immediately. So I'm kind of feeling like, if I've, and I've asked the team, um, under Diane's leadership to develop a protocol, a procedure to kind of guide schools and walking through that process so that they can then say, okay, when school starts back up, we know that these, these 20 kids, that 25 kids that didn't participate weren't anything, we've got to get to them first because we've mm -hmm. got to know that they are on board. What are they doing? Are they going to be face to face? Are they going to be at home? What do we have to do? Those are the IEP meetings and things that they would be looking at having pretty quick and doing really fast. Um, and then, you know, you kind of go from there as far as your urgency and what kids to get to and have IEP meetings for. How um, would we um, determine who they are? Will there be some sort of evalu evaluation or uh, well, like how are going to find been it's going to have to start with first the administration and probably LEA facilitators, assistant principals or whatever, and, and talking with teachers to say, okay, Ms. Neesmith, you had 25 kindergartners in your class. Five of them had IEPs. Let's talk about those five. How, you know, teachers can provide some feedback on how those kiddos did so that principals can know out of Ms. Neesmith's class, she's got two kids that had IEPs that we've got to get to quick. The other three, she said she can handle, she's good with, you know, we'll move them. Maybe have, obviously have some communication with parents. I mean, not, you know, leave them out in the dark of what's going on. But, um, you know, just kind of know that's how it'll kind of start is that school level collaboration on basically saying what kids do we need to reach out to first or families do we need to reach out to first and then if, you know, Sarah, if, if you're the mom of the child that wasn't able to participate, we're going to get in touch with you and say, Miss Frederick, we've got to, you know, we really need to see your child here. We need to see how they, you know, where they're performing at now that they've been out of school for this amount of time. You know, if that's going to be a face to face kind of an, uh, an assessment or an over the, you know, virtual assessment, just to touch base, just to kind of say, hey, child, right. how are you, you know. Some of it's going to be very informal at first, um, and then it may get more formalized depending on the child and kind of what's going on with them. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm we're working on some proceed, you know, some procedures to kind of guide teams through that. Staffing specialists will have a role in that, you know, when they return because they support their schools and um, the LA facilitators. It's really kind of a it's a way to prioritize. Mm -hmm. what, kid, what kids, what, you know, as far as IEPs, do you need, and, and 504 plans as well, do we need to get to first? So and, would this also, um, would this also include our kids who maybe educationally did everything, but showed, you know, like Nevaeh, she regresses. 
mm-hmm. no matter what, you know, what it is. Uh, would it include those kids who've re- regret, uh, regressed um, as well? Of course. You know, I think that would be a parent question. I don't know if necessarily the teacher would see that. Um, well, that's the thing is that who's determining that she regressed for you to provide feedback and say, you know, Nevea, even though she participated, I do see that she's not, you know, her skills are not where she was before the pandemic. That's where the discussion is to say, okay, so Miss Frederick, while we're, you know, getting this thing going, if you can keep, keep in touch with her teacher, let's get her going and then kind of get together on a timeline as far as where we can. I mean, the LEA facilitators and the staff are only going to be able to, you know, hit a certain number of kids per day, you know, right. as just timing wise. Right. Uh, so I kind of see it almost as like a triage kind of a situation as for lack of a better word. Yeah, no, that's right. But that's kind of what we've got to do. I mean, and there's going to be some kids that they're going to know right off the bat, these kids aren't going to be able to participate. We're going to have to refer them either over to hospital homebound or we know this is going to be the status and, and, you know, they'll be able to do that. Um, that that's just my visualization of kind of how I see it working. Um, ideally, um, of course, you know, getting it all down on paper and guiding teams to do that. And hopefully schools being consistent with how they do that could be a different story when you're talking about so many and such the scary part of all this is everything's still so unknown. You know, and everything mm-hmm. changes every day. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we make one decision today and then tomorrow it's got to be something different. Yeah, and that's it, my concern. Uh, you know, first day back at school, <laughs> we have yep. this entire plan laid out and then everybody comes back to the table on Wednesday and says, mm, none of it worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, got to well, change everything. Right. And that unfortunately may just happen. I mean, you know, I. I think if we can just provide as many suggestions and ideas on how to do it that um, is global enough to kind of try and catch everybody, mm-hmm. then that's good. And then, but also understand, which is purely the nature of ESC services anyways, you're always going to have outliers. You're always going to have mm-hmm. those individual cases that don't fit in any box, you know, nothing like that. And you've got to treat them individually and figure out what works for that child and that family in isolation from anybody else. That's, that's what we do. That, that's the nature of our work. Right. And Dr. Steinke, I have uh, some concerns if, if the parents are given the option of um, either pulp virtual or face-to-face, that we would have enough staff if many of the deaf, hard of hearing students chose to go, um, you know, if a lot of the hard of hearing students, parents chose for them to go virtually, how, how would we have enough staff? Because, um, you know, you have a lot of students still left at the schools, possibly, and those interpreters may be needed there for that, or maybe they would just work both. (laughs) I don't know. Well, I'm actually, I'm glad you said that. I actually had a conversation with uh, Darren Williams yesterday that, you know, is the principal for Pulp Virtual. And he's um, looking at the people that have identified that that's the route that they want to go. Mm-hmm. Um, he's putting together the information on the students with disabilities that he would have, what their, you know, um, placement levels are as far as regular mm-hmm. class, separate class, um, their disability areas, so that I can see what supports we need to add over to his team um, for okay. those purposes. There's also a... Um, and it's kind of hard to explain. In fact, I don't totally 100% understand it fully myself. But Polk Virtual uses, you know, multiple platforms depending on the course that's being taught or the staff availability mm-hmm. or things like that. So one of the platforms that he has accessibility to from the company provides what appears to be kind of a higher level of support and accommodations than what we're necessarily accustomed to simply because I think they have more staff. I don't think it has to do with the inability to do something. I think it's just that they have allocated in their company more resources for that. So we kind of tossed around the idea of depending on the kids that come in, and this is where the individualization comes in, 
maybe some kids would be enrolled in that platform. It's still pulp virtual, but it kind of, it's like, what classroom are you going in? Are you going to Miss Neesmith's classroom because you need this support? Or are you going to Miss Frederick's because you need that? It's kind of that level. Mm -hmm. And then um, that may inherently provide some of the things that the kids need automatically. And we wouldn't have to then assign additional Polk County personnel to them. The, um, um, the interpreter part of it, um, we you may, if you do get a chance to talk with him, we may have to really collaborate because interpreters are not like a typical staff that's easy to find. Right. I mean, we have three openings in the itinerant department for interpreters, and we don't have a lot of applicants right now. Right. And so it's very difficult to find, but we could help them and give them some resources if they did want to contact with interpreters, mm -hmm. you know, um, because am I, am I understanding it correctly that let's just say they needed some interpreters and we provided, like if we transferred some of ours, would they, they, then those interpreters would then work for Polk? Am I understanding that correct? Yeah, Polk Virtual is basically just another Polk County school. Right. So at Haines City High School, McLaughlin Middle School, mm -hmm. Medella Elementary, Polk okay. Virtual. It's just another school. It just doesn't have its own building. Okay. So we'd be, you know, we'd be supporting that school like we do any others. Okay. It's just that I'm, I'm in conversations with him that if we've had, I don't know, a thousand of our students from across the district move from a traditional brick and mortar school and want to now get their education at Polk virtual. Well, that's a, that's a thousand students worth of staff mm -hmm. allocations that have to come out of, possibly out of their traditional brick and mortar school assignments and go and support Polk Virtual. Now the district level question for that, as far as personnel and all that, and you know, for Tedra and, and Michelle and them is, okay, do we, it, Ms. Neesmith, if you're currently a teacher at Medell Elementary, but all of your kindergartners are now doing Polk Virtual, are you gonna stay as a Medell teacher and just, teach under Polk Virtual? Are you going to change from a Medella teacher to a Polk Virtual teacher? What does that look like? You know, and some of that is kind of the logistics behind the scenes in SAP, you mm -hmm. know, our system of how that works. Um, okay. But the reality is we can't have a thousand kids go into Polk Virtual and not provide them with additional teachers, you know. And do them. they, I'm sorry, do they do a lot of independent work as well they're given like when I was reading online it looks like they give them the assignments and it's a lot of independent work or do they have live lessons which tends that tends to be more beneficial for deaf students because they can see it being signed as opposed to independent study they do they do both I think p virtual instruction at that level is inherently going to have more independent work for a student than a typical traditional classroom would simply because you're not with that teacher for six hours a day, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, so okay. I mean, they do both, but there's probably, you know, which is I why for our students with disabilities, we have such a high level of discussion about online courses for them because can they mm -hmm. access them? Can they handle them? Can they handle the independent work that's required? Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like that. I have a question about the enrollment criteria. Um, I was looking at that last night and I can tell you, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily know our numbers across the board, but um we're not going to have a lot of kids and, you know, special needs kids uh, enrolled with the criteria that they have set now. Will that stay in place? Uh, because they have to score three on uh, the Florida, you know, state assessments. And um, well, so that what they're doing is basically any any parent can apply for the child to be in it. Um. And then what Darren and his team do is if it's a student with a disability that has an IEP, of course, they look at that IEP to just see what does that student require? You know, what does that look like? What are their services? You know, um, things like that. And then they have a discussion with the family on what that would look like if 
that student were enrolled under Polk Virtual. Sometimes it's a situation where the family says, okay, we're good, move it forward. Sometimes the parents say, oh, wait a minute, that's not what we thought it was going to be. So they kind of, you know, change their mind. Sometimes it's a situation where you have a student that may require, I don't know, their IEP right now requires, you know, a lot of minutes of service through reading and math. And then they get into the virtual system and realize that they can actually do the virtual program without that assistance and they're fine. Or they get in the virtual program and realize the importance of that assistance and what they need. And so they kind of back off the virtual platform. You know, um, it really is so individualized to every student. Um, the one thing, though, that we have said is the Polk virtual does not provide um, the, in, the level of support for students with significant cognitive disabilities that are on modified access points that they require. I mean, they just simply can't. You right. know, we know based on the nature of those kids' disabilities, um, they pretty much have to have face-to-face -face instruction. Right. Unless they simply have a, fa a parent at home that's home full time and, you know, has the background and experience to be able to provide that level of instruction. And I know we do have some families that can do that, but we've, you know, the majority of them don't. Right. So if he has a student that is enrolling that's on access points, most of them he tells, he has those conversations with those families and it explains Virtual is not, prob this virtual program is probably not going to be um, as easily accessible for you. It's the same conversation we have when families are trying to do Florida virtual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have that obligation to explain to them, you know, what's appropriate, you know, for them and what's not. It's kind of, it's kind of the reverse situation of when we have a student that's on, you know, regular standards or whatever, and a family wants their kids to go to one of our ESC center schools. Mm -hmm. And we have to explain to them why it's not appropriate. You know, right. um, so it's, it's, it's kind of the, it's just the reverse. So now following if, you know, if they were to take a kid, uh, who was Florida standard, um, I mean, they would be following the IEP, the same laws apply in the virtual school that would in, you know, any other regular school though, correct? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. They have to implement the IEP. And that's why I've been having the conversation with, with uh, Darren about his staff, because I told him, I said, I can't expect you to be taking a thousand more kids of which, you know, just the law of, of our percentages. If we have 13% students with disabilities in the district that are on IEPs, he's going to have a, what's that? I'm not good at math. So what's that? 130 kids, maybe? <laughs> um, that have IEPs now, and he doesn't have the staff to provide support that they typically get well he needs some teachers you know right. it would basically be a support facilitator or an inclusion type of a teacher that would not be the teacher of record because the content teacher the math teacher has to be the student's teacher but right. the ESC teacher that we assign would be getting in there and getting in those lessons and collaborating with that teacher on how to support those students just like they do in a brick and mortar setting mm -hmm. So yeah, they're still responsible for it, but we are going to have some families um, that are going to want that virtual platform through Polk Virtual, and it may not be appropriate, and there might be a little bit of trial and error with some kids, unfortunately. Yeah, because I'm seeing that a lot of our parents, you know, when they put out the unhope, <laughs> um, I mean, they, they flocked to Polk Virtual. Uh, and, and a lot of them got kicked back uh, because of the McKay or because they had an IEP or, I mean, I was flooded with questions and I'm like, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know, uh, yeah. but I will ask definitely. But I do think that now that they know that an entire plan is, is being put in place, a lot of those families who went to Polk Virtual will be backing out and choosing a, another option. Uh, so yeah. I think that is going to lessen uh, now, you know, once we give them all three options. Yeah, uh, agreed. And, and Michelle and I've had a, it's funny though, because with the center school principals, we had been brainstorming, okay, <laughs> 
we've got these kids that we know cannot be in the brick and mortar setting come back immediately because they either have health care issues mm -hmm. or their family does or, you know, something like that. But they also can't do Polk Virtual. So how, how are we going to do this with them? And the principals and I have been kind of brainstorming that for several months. And it really came down to a logistics of how do we schedule them in our system in order to ensure we're still getting the funding that they require, um, you know, and that the teachers have the access, parents have the, you know, what was that going to kind of look like? So it's now morphed into this third option that we're talking about for all schools where the kids stay enrolled at their regular school, whatever, wherever they are, but they do, you know, a distance learning. I kind of personally think it's basically like what we were doing in March and April, you know, right. That's and is that is that a for sure go? I mean, it's, it's definitely not, going to happen or it's still up in the air? It's still, as far as I know, it's still up in the air because I think we're waiting for this task force to kind of get more things together between this week and next week before okay. it um, goes out. But um, I, I definitely think it's going to, it's got to happen. I mean, it has to happen. It has to happen. Because if we close, if we close down, we're going to have to have something, you know, if we close a school down or, you know, something like that, we're going to have to have something that runs alongside it anyways. Right. Uh, so it's got to happen. Right. Right. So um, I, I see that happening. I Now I will say this. It's going to be probably um, more of an, a, a commitment on behalf of families and stuff than and teachers than it was in, in April and May, simply right. because, you know, we were already in the fourth quarter at that point and no, <laughs> we are, I don't want to say winging it, but it all happened so fast. We were mm -hmm. just doing what we could. Well, now, and it was also, you know, FSA season. So there really wasn't a lot of education planned, you know, for that fourth quarter because it was all about taking the FSA. Right. So right. it really was a wing it, you know, situation. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I do see it happening. It's just the logistics of literally saying, you know, how's it going to happen? I, I think one of the biggest challenges we're having, which thankfully I'm not on that team, um, is trying to determine, okay, what is it going to look like for our personnel? How many people are going to be able to come into a brick and mortar setting are willing to come into a brick and mortar setting versus those that need to be serving as, an, you know, virtual instructors, either because, they personally have situation, you know, whatever it is and mm -hmm. trying to balance that. I mean, if, if 75% of our kids are coming back to a brick and mortar setting, but only 50% of our staff are okay. What is that? H how do we do that? <laughs> right. That's true. And, um, um there's a, one of the students, uh, one of the deaf students from what I understand does have some health issues. And so, um, they, you know, Pulp Virtual may not be the best option, mm -hmm. but they, I don't know that this person would qualify for hospital homebound. So that third area would be a good place if, if it does work out that way. Right, right. I, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Um, I think it's just trying to make sure that we have as many answers about it and logistics worked out before we put it out there for families to say this is what it, because unfortunately that's what we keep running it uh, running up against we're you know we're trying to get information out so quickly so that we can answer questions but then we don't everything changes so fast that we we get it out and then it changes and we it's just <laughs> I mean, and that's going to be an, another thing too that i was looking at uh, and it's mentioned on the the paper as well sort of the hospital homebound x you know um we're going to have a lot of kids who, um, or a lot of parents who see that as an option who may not have seen that as an option before. Right. Uh, and do we do hospital homebound or do we do the e-learning, you know, separating those two, um, because a lot of our kids could, you know, qualify, um, right. the, you know, probably more of our center school kids. Um, yeah. and well, do we, are we that you know like yeah. what, what is it that we're going to do there 
So what we're going to do there, and this was the other part of the conversation I had with Darren, because Lisa Carr, who's the senior manager for Hospital Homebound and, you know, runs that that team, she reports yes. to Darren. So um, we had the conversation, and she has, has, has had an increase in applications for the fall for mm -hmm. students, um, which means, you know, going through the eligibility process, number one. Um, and I, I, I shared with her, you know, you might have some kids that, traditionally during a school year based on their medical condition or whatever might not have qualified, but now do the circumstances may, you know, would qualify under extraordinary circumstances, you know, you right. those things in there. Um, so she has had a, has had an increase in applicants. What she's going to do and what that third option will allow for her to do is have the conversation with the family of, Okay, Miss Frederick, if you are interested in Nevaeh being in hospital homebound, let's talk about what that would look like. Because traditionally, hospital homebound students, their teacher comes to their home and provides their instruction. Right. But if we're in a situation where the teacher can't come to the home because either the child can't have somebody, act, you know, someone from the outside coming around them, or, well, that would really be what it is, or somebody else in the house can't. Right. Then what would be the difference between a hospital homebound teacher now being your virtual teacher or your traditional school teacher being your virtual teacher? Right. You know, so for those center school kids or kids at other schools, if we can provide that third option where the teacher at their traditional school is their distance learning teacher that they're registered with and everything, then that would be a better option than hospital homebound. Right. I agree um, because that program doesn't have as many accessible teachers, I guess I should say. Um, well, it, do. Does, it No, it doesn't because it's simply their numbers don't um, necessitate the need for that many teachers. The right. other the other thing about hospital homebound is it, inherently for the nature of that service and how students traditionally qualify for it are situations where the students can't do a full-time five, six hours a day of instruction. Right. So mm -hmm. they, you know, that's why their, their hours and stuff are limited and, and all that because of the nature, whatever their medical conditions are require less, um, you know, less hours. So. Right. And you would have a teacher more likely to take the e-learning for the hours versus, you know, two hours at a hospital homebound. Right. Um, Right. Okay. So if we, you know, if we had a student um, that unfortunately um, was diagnosed with COVID, you know, and literally couldn't and was so sick, you know, ended up in the hospital and ICU or something like that, they're going to base probably be a traditional hospital homebound student. Correct. Right. Because right. they've conduct, they've contracted some kind of a, you know, um, illness that just like a cancer patient or, you know, somebody that has kidney issues, you know, whatever right. all various things are. So that kind of hits our, that last bullet then too, on our, um, our, uh, objective there, those kids that we're talking about, um, Lisa is prepared to have those conversations. We've kind of got that outlined already. That, that honestly was one of the easiest things to do. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I mean, there's really no, you know, our main goal is to get everybody in school where they need to socialize and, you know, uh, see smiling faces. And um, but the reality is we have some kids who just can't. Right. Uh, right. So what you know, that's really the only option we have at this time. Right. Well, and the other thing is, if we end up in a situation where, you know, because of the way the cases are going now, you know, if if things change again and then we're not allowed to do face to face, mm -hmm. you know, I, <laughs> I don't well, know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, you know, I've seen some very concerning numbers and some, oh. you know, high up people pretty concerned about the, the rise, um, you know, but, but, what are we, do you know what we're waiting on? Is it, I mean, I know they've said we must open up schools. Could we, as a school district, say no? 
or is it mandated that we open? If it, if it was to become, you know, a bigger issue and nothing was done from the top. I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable answering that because I don't know that I know the true legal answer to that. I know that, you know, we're required to follow Department of Ed, Florida Department of Education guidelines for instruction and all that, and whatever the governor and the commissioner of education require. And then the superintendents, of course, have a responsibility to carry that out. Um, but then if, you know, if there's a situation in our district that requires a level of concern for Ms. Bird to say, you know, I'm not sure that opening is appropriate, then her responsibility, as I understand it, is to, of course, work with the commissioner of education on, you know, what would that look like for our district and, and what opportunity or what options do does she have as superintendent to change any of that um right. what often happens is you know it's very um it's very uncommon for something to happen just in one district and nowhere else right so in this kind of situation that we're in it's affecting everybody mm -hmm. of course some areas more than others so at least she's not alone in some of that um and that's why the that's why their conversations at that level are so critical. I mean, they talk every day, as far as I know, except maybe maybe Saturdays and Sundays, and then they might even be talking then. I don't know. Okay. Well, and, and it's good to know that that she at least has that outlet if something were to happen. You know, I, I don't think people know that that communication is there. You know, you you tend to think like them versus us. So her having oh, that, no. you know, that in, if something were to happen, I think that would uh, uh, put some people's minds at ease. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she she has a good relationship um, as far as I've ever seen. I mean, I don't I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I'm not part of it. But, um, you know, I know that she's she's definitely guided by what the, um, you know, what the Department of Education requires and provides and. Guide, them, guide superintendents to do <laughs> all 67 of them so yep okay well if you guys think of any other things that we need to jot down after this just email me um i'll try and do a recap in the next couple of days i got to send something to michelle anyways um and then you know we can kind of go from there next week when we meet um probably just have each group kind of um, give a quick update on kind of what you went through and if there's some, you know, what they, what they talked about and kind of recommended. Um, is next week uh, a meeting with just us three or are we going back to the whole subcommittee or the entire task force? Just, we'll go back to the subcommittee, I believe. Okay. I think. Okay. I, I do have a question now that we've kind of discussed some of the, <clears throat> issues and challenges how will we proceed from here will we come up with a plan to like for example you know we know then that the deaf and hard of hearing uh, student population there are so many different challenges what can we do to close the gap and tie up the loose strings you know that kind of thing what what will we be able to do um Will it just be a matter of, like, for example, we'll have a, the, uh, the, all of the interpreters will come to a meeting when we first return. Mm -hmm. Will it be a matter of us just sharing the information and helping them understand where to go from there? And then maybe um, the schools, the flow schools that do have um, deaf student population and then even the outliers just making sure that we over collaborate with those people that are involved to help them understand the situation or will we just like maybe continue this discussion and kind of figure some of these things out as we go well because i have the the unique opportunity to be you know in kind of two different roles as far as task force and leading the division that does a lot of that stuff um what i would recommend is that what you guys do anyways, Rhonda, with your team is that y'all do come together and kind of probably 
come up almost with like a toolkit for teachers that you guys could recommend. Because I feel like if all of the interpreters were kind of um, supporting teachers or providing guidance or, or, you know, recommendations that were consistent mm -hmm. from site to site, which you already do, I know that, but maybe if you kind of outlined it as with the pandemic kind of stuff, these are some things we're recommending. Mm -hmm. um, then what I would do is then over in the, in the instructional continuity plan as a part of this task force is we'd have information that says something along the lines of, you know, teachers and staff who support students that are deaf, hard of hearing will work collaboratively with their interpreter team, you know, with the toolkit of resources on how to collaborate specifically to support those kids, you know, something along those lines. So, okay. I, I envision then the continuity plan and the direction that we give from a district level as being a little bit more um, global and then okay. it lays her down into our district team such as yours to see what that means specifically for those kids. Okay. Does, that make sense? does that make sense? It does and I'm I'm glad that we kind of had this discussion because it's a you know it's kind of a tricky situation because this the interpreters are school based except for you know the itinerant group right and so what happened when we closed even though we were trying to provide guidance um we still were under the obligation of letting the the principals determine how to utilize those interpreters and so you know a lot of the principals still looked to us but we were kind of more, it was almost like there was school base and then there was itinerant staff. And then our roles were somewhat different due to the school closures. So anyway, it, it is good that we can kind of work collaboratively as one team of interpreters. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that that's um, I have one last question I wrote down here and I forgot to ask earlier uh, about the related services. So mm -hmm. if we have a student who gets services, uh, but they decide to go e-learning or Polk virtual, will there be an option to provide face-to-face? -face? Like, can those kids go into the school or could those therapists go into the home? Yes. If, um, you know, if not I don't I don't know about the therapist going into the home, but we have had the discussion on um, allowing them to come into the schools for face-to-face -face therapies. Um, and that is definitely something that we would be exploring um, because even if they're in those systems, they still have to, you know, their IEP still re uh, includes those type of services. So we have to address them. Now, of course, for some of them, it's gonna look different because you know, if a student receives occupational or physical therapy that includes hand over hand assistance during instruction, mm -hmm. but they're doing all their instruction at home, that's a service that can't be provided just because they're, you know, um, but yes, we've talked about allowing them to come into the school um, for services. One of the barriers to that is going to be transportation. Right. Um, so that's, that's one of the things we've got to figure out, but yeah, that's definitely going to be an option. Okay. I'm glad you said that because that, that reminds me we need to. Um, include that in the document. Okay. Yep. That's all I have for now. Great. Okay. Well, good discussion this morning, ladies. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for, you know, helping us kind of figure out how we're going from here i know we're trying to figure all of it out it's crazy little and i think breaking it down into these smaller groups is going to help everyone tremendously uh yeah. you know trying to talk over even 10 people uh you know we we end up with nothing right <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh so i think i think you know our task force is definitely going to uh get completed in the time we need it completed <laughs> well, I hope so i you know i hope so i know i can't do it by myself so i i needed to figure out a way to okay how can we get all this done <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no i think it's, it's wonderful and i think we're well on our way we are
All right. Well, I'm going to stop recording and y'all have a good afternoon and thank you too. enjoy your vacation. Thank you. Have a good holiday. Thank, thank you. you. Have fun. Take bye, care. ladies. All right. Bye.